moved where we are today without the help of Congressman Smith. He was a lone voice in, in Washington. So 44 years into Lyme disease, and where are we now? We're actually not much further than we were at the onset. And I began my efforts in 1994, and in 1984, a decade after Lyme was first looked at in Connecticut, right here in Wall Township, where I was on the Board of Education. And you may not know it, but our district was riddled with Lyme disease in, in 1984. The staff, the students, the administrators, and at that time, I was a mother of three. Today, I'm a grandmother of four. In the late 80s, two of my daughters developed Lyme, and it was fortunate that I had already started advocating, realizing there was no information. The government gave us nothing. I couldn't find information. The superintendent said, you can give it out if you can find it, and uh, it was very, very difficult to find it. I finally found it on Earl Naval Weapons Station. We were probably the first school district in the country to give out information on Lyme disease. So then my youngest daughter, uh, unfortunately, um, I fought to get her diagnosed. I knew she had it, but getting a doctor to her, agree that she had it, uh, delayed her diagnosis significantly. And so she did develop chronic Lyme disease. She was out of school for four full years here in Wall and two partial years. Yet she went on, after a lot of treatment and a lot of fighting, to graduate Phi Beta Kappa from Johns Hopkins, and she's in the workplace today. Despite the fact for three of those years, she was in temporal lobe <coughs> seizures, seizing 17 hours a day, six out of every seven days a week for three years straight. It was a nightmare. And you know what my doctors said? They said, don't tell anybody. I was like, what do you mean, don't tell anybody? Well, if you tell anybody out there in the public health field, your daughter will be put in a psychiatric institution. Little did I know <coughs> that that was the truth. At the time, that was what happened, it still happens today. And unfortunately, a lot of those people are denied their Lyme treatment while they're there. We didn't have to go that route. But my, not everybody has a, a, a staunch advocate and has family behind them. So, what do we still not have all this time after 44 years? A definitive test. The tests we're using today come from a 1994 meeting, and they're less than 50% accurate. How's that for a test that's supposed to determine the rest of your life, perhaps? And we don't have successful treatment. 20% of or more of patients who receive standard treatment develop chronic Lyme disease. We don't have access to care. 72% of patients see more than four doctors before diagnosis. 31% travel 100 plus miles in order to get treatment. But what do we have now? Well, we now have 20 tick-borne diseases in the United States we have to contend with. And 60% of patients are diagnosed with what's called co-infection, meaning more than one tick-borne disease at the same time according to my Lyme data, which is the largest patient uh, registry for Lyme in the country. This year, there are at least four cases already of Powassan virus in New Jersey. If you're not familiar with Powassan, it's transmitted by the same tick that transmits Lyme disease, has a very high fatality rate, has no treatment, and 50% of the survivors are left with permanent serious neurological complications such as headache, muscle, muscle wasting, and memory problems. Case numbers were small, but now they're beginning to rise. It's spreading in here in the Northeast and also the Midwest. So what's the problem? The government has not devoted attention or monies to the issue and has allowed the ticks to spread unchecked across our country and allowed disease organisms to infect an unsuspecting public. All the while, they minimize the issue, not providing appropriate education and not providing the necessary research funds. In 2019, you, this is like an unbelievable figure to me, CDC and NIH together had a budget of $43 million. I call that egg money. That is totally ludicrous. This Far, this disease far surpasses in case numbers any other disease except some of the sexually transmitted diseases. And it's found in 80 countries worldwide. 
So we do now have the working group that Congressman Smith mentioned, and why? Again, because patients and advocates, including the Lyme Disease Association, with Congressman Smith's help, work hard for decades to have that. And that was this, something that other diseases have had forever, all the other major diseases. But we, we could not sit, advocates, patients, treating physicians, could not sit at the same table as officials to talk about our disease. They made all the decisions, and you can see where that led. So I've worked with Congressman Smith for 27 years to get the atten attention for Lyme, to pass legislation, and then to get the uh, working group members on board from our community. I just got my second appointment. I was the only one from the public, I believe, to uh, get a second term appointment on the working group. And I chair uh, two subcommittees there, the Access to Care Reimbursement Training and Education Subcommittee, which is all about our patients. How can we get these people access? How can we get them reimbursement? So in 2018, as Congressman Smith mentioned, we discovered that NIH had no strategy. They had no national strategy on Lyme and tick-borne diseases. So the report we had recommended that the NIH produce the strategy. And sure enough, about a year later, just recently, they came forth with it. And uh, it outlines what kinds of research needs to be done to help patients and to stop the spread of the disease. It's a first step. We also need passage of the Chick Act, sponsored in the House by Congressman Smith, to bring all tick-borne diseases under one office in, in the country. It's ridiculous that right now, uh, down in Washington, even now, even with the working group, a lot of different agencies don't know what the other agencies are doing. So we need this done for the general public, for our children ages 0 to 19 who make up 29% of Lyme cases, for children 5 to 9 and 10 to 14 who are at the highest risk, and folks, for our babies 0 to 4 who make up 5% of Lyme cases. We need it for the unborn because unfortunately Lyme can cross the, cross the placenta and if a, a pregnant woman doesn't get appropriate treatment, that, that baby can die. And so we need your help in the media to get this message out and make this legislation happen. And I thank you very much for